Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatore. So I'm going to talk a little bit about bollock daggers today. Um, and um, Todd over at Todd's Workshop, obviously a friend of mine, done videos together. Um, he has done some excellent videos about all sorts of medieval daggers, of course, because he makes them. And in fact, the examples I'm going to be showing here today are from him. Uh, they are from uh, Todd Cutler and Todd's Workshop, in fact. Um, and so I highly recommend you obviously go and check out his channel. Um, I'll put a link below to a really good video he did about a year ago, in fact almost exactly a year ago, um, where he runs through the sort of timeline and development of the so-called bollock dagger. Um, now this is an incredibly important type of dagger. What I'm going to try and do here is not obviously cover ground that Todd's already covered, but mention a few other things which are almost sort of an appendix to what he's put in that video. So have a look at Todd's video below, but then hopefully have a look at mine as well. So first, thing, first things first, I should say that there are two predominant types of um, dagger that, uh, in, that are used in the 15th century. And I'm going to be looking um, mostly at the 15th century here. First of all, I'm going to little, look a little bit at, at um, the um, bollock dagger as a thing and some aspects of its design. But then I'm also going to look at its uh, comparison with the rondel dagger and perhaps how they interacted uh, in the 15th century. But what I should say is is that if we go back into the 14th century, then there were probably three really important uh, types of dagger around, or dominant types of dagger around, and one of those I'm not going to cover, and that is the basilard. And the basilard was also around in the 15th century. Um, in perhaps slightly more specific areas, it went out of favour in, for example, um, England and to a lesser degree in France as well, but it was very, very popular in Switzerland, still in uh, parts of Germany as well. But I'm not going to talk about the basilard here. I'm going to look predominantly at the um, bollock dagger and the rondel dagger, um, which are the two uh, predominant dagger types that we really see in the treatises of the 15th century. The rondel dagger is actually what is predominantly shown, and I'm going to talk about that when we get to, uh, when we get to the rondel dagger. Um, but we are principally looking at the bollock dagger and where it sat in military life and society at that time. So first of all, what I've got here is a Todd's Workshop. This is actually several years old. Um, so it's before Todd Cutler and Todd Workshop split into two entities, shall we say. So it was back in the days of Todd stuff. Um, and this is a uh, very nice um, late 15th century style, um, ebony handled um, with bronze or brass fittings, end cap and um, sort of, what should we call it, bolster um, for a relatively, I wouldn't say high status, but a above middle status um, uh, bollock dagger. Now, as Todd covered in his video, by this point, I mean, what we can say is in, in the, shall we say, 14th century, um, so it really at the beginning of the 14th century is when bollock knives or bollock daggers um, started to appear. And it does appear that generally speaking, with a few exceptions for most of the 14th century, certainly up until, well, up, up until about the third, uh, third quarter of the um, 14th century, um, bollock daggers were predominantly commoners weapons, whereas generally speaking, the uh, rondel dagger was more of a kind of knightly weapon or at least a professional soldier's weapon. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute in application specifically to the 15th century. Um, and the bollock dagger, as Todd um, delineated in his video, starts off in the 14th century, beginning of 14th century, as more of a common people's all-purpose self-defense knife and is therefore carried also in a military context by people like archers and spearmen, billmen, this type of thing. But then um, it does by about the 1350s, 60s, 70s start to appear occasionally at the side of, um, of knights or men-at-arms. But, uh, and we do see therefore higher status as we go through the 15th century and into the 16th century, we see higher and higher status versions of it. Um, but first of all, I'd like to say, why do we think that this design came around in the 14th century? Well, the simple answer is we don't know. And this is a great, um, great sort of thing that someone out there should really go away and research what is the thing that came before the bollock dagger or bollock knife. 
We don't really know, and uh, as Todd says in his video, we don't really know why these bollocks suddenly appear on these things. And these stuck around for a long time. As he shows in this video, by 1600, it had turned into the dudgeon type thing, which is essentially a bollock dagger. And really this fed into, by, um, by uh, the late 1600s, into the more classical um, kind of dirk, Highland dirk, as we see here, um, which he talks about in his video. And a lot of people don't realize that these dirks have their roots in bollock daggers but actually if you look at them it becomes quite obvious because the shape often on uh, highland dirks you get a lot of um, kind of celtic as people call it uh, decoration in other words intertwined decoration or other forms of highland decoration um, which sometimes obscure the fact that down here at the uh, guard if we call it that or bolster you've got two vestigial bollocks essentially okay um, and this uh, this flared cap that we see here as Todd showed in his video if we look at the Mary Rose um, bollock daggers of which there are I think dozens there are loads and loads of them you can see them at the Mary Rose Museum now the wooden handles at least the blades don't survive they have this flared kind of end cap and it does seem that probably if we're talking Mary Rose sank in 1545 so we're probably looking at by you know by 1600 or the 1600s when the Highland Dirk has come about and this carried on right the way through to the 19th century. In fact, for Highland officers, it's still modern dress today, although it doesn't look exactly like this. It does seem that that flared end probably came from that route from the Tudor period. But these are very much from bollock daggers. Anyway, that's a that's a digression, and Todd covers that in his video. So coming back to the 14th and 15th century. So what we do see is by the end of the 14th century, the normal knightly dagger is very occasionally being replaced at the side, um, at the sword belt essentially, um, by, or sometimes it's connected directly to the armour, it has to be said, um, by the bollock dagger. Now, for a second, we're just going to talk about the um, rondel dagger. Now, interestingly, both of these weapons are products of the 14th century. So whilst this appears in the 14th century, this also appears in the uh, 14th century. And I think that uh, we should be reluctant to purely view this as a civilian dagger or a, um, uh, you know, something that came about as a tool. I do think that from the outset, they are both weapons. Um, and I do think also that the design of the Rondel dagger, as I've said before, is partly dictated by armoured fighting. Now, um, why is that? Well, first of all, I have to say, so not all rondel daggers have two rondels, that is the discs. Lots of rondel daggers only have one disc at the guard end um, and a sort of small ball pommel or other sorts of small pommel at the other end. Okay, so you've got to ask, so given that this is the predominant disc, and, we, and admittedly, if we look later on, we do sign, find some later Ronald Daggers where you've got a disc at the back end and not at the front end, but let's ignore those for now. The predominant types of early Ronald Dagger always, they don't always have a disc at the back end, but they always have a disc at the front end, at the blade end. So the question is, why? Why do you have this on those daggers, on rondel daggers, that are predominantly worn by men at arms, i.e. people who wear lots of armour? And why do you have bollocks on uh, daggers that are worn predominantly by people who don't wear armour? Well, the big difference, uh, in fact I'll just unsheath both of these, the big difference between a, a someone like an archer and someone like a man at arms is one of these okay so um number one the and this is a 15th century mid 15th century um mitten gauntlet okay but obviously we're talking about the 14th century here so we're talking about fingered gauntlets which i don't have one of to hand so to speak um but gauntlets are a factor number one secondly the whole rest of the armor okay so first of all when you're wearing armor uh, if your vision is impaired at all if you've got a visor down or indeed if you're less flexible because you have a cuirass on or coat of plates maybe in the middle of the 14th century or indeed, if you're fighting against other armoured opponents predominantly, or that at least is your, your goal, even if it's not what ends up happening on the battlefield, then that's going to dictate the weapons you choose. Case in point, the poleaxe. Okay? So the poleaxe, as I showed in a recent video, um, search if you haven't seen it, just search for uh, poleaxe or axe even in my videos. On, uh, you'll see it a few videos back. Um, the poleaxe is a specialised armoured 
fighting weapon, but that is coming from two directions. Because yes, number one, it is specialised to fight against armoured people, but equally it is also specialised, predominantly, not always, there are exceptions, but predominantly to be used by armoured people. Because what do the people who don't wear full armour normally use? The people who don't wear full armour normally use something like a bill or a spear, which gives them longer range. However, if you have armour, it enables you to come into close range much more quickly, much more safely, ignoring minor hits that would normally incapacitate or possibly even kill an unarmoured person. Those hits will bounce off your armour, you come into close range and you stay at close range where you have the advantage. And the poleaxe is a it can be used at relatively long range, kind of same kind of reach as a longsword, but um, it can equally be used at very close range as well. Um, and at close range, being armoured, you have a huge advantage against um, other people who are unarmoured, or indeed, if you're fighting against an armoured person, you have to get at close range a lot of the time anyway to find the gaps in their armour. So, um, if you're fighting against armoured people or you're wearing armour, that dictates the weapons you choose like the um, poleaxe example, and therefore it will also affect the um, dagger you choose. Now there are a couple of big advantages to the dagger. In the past I have spoken about the fact that having this disc on the back, if you're wearing something like a, a hand skull bassinet and you can't um, look down, you can't necessarily see your dagger, you can feel for it with your gauntleted hand, and if you've got a big disc at the back there, it enables you to pull it out quickly when you need it. Okay, so that's the first thing. But we're going to ignore that for a second because whilst that is a factor and that's an interesting thing, that doesn't relate to the um, uh, bollock dagger comparison and also not all the early ones had that. So that's something they seem to have come along with perhaps a little bit later when they went, oh, it might be useful to have another one of these. The really interesting one for the purposes of this discussion is the disc at the front. Why do you have that disc at the front? Well, obviously it keeps your hand on the grip. If you're smashing around in armour using huge amounts of force, perhaps wrestling on falling over, falling on the ground, wrestling, all this kind of stuff, you don't want to have any risk of your hand riding up onto the blade. One of the potential risks with a smaller guard, like on a bollock dagger, is that if you're holding it in a gauntleted hand, your hand might slip in, in falling over and wrestling and all this kind of stuff. Um, or grappling might slip down here onto the blade and you will end up not having a proper grip on your weapon and potentially even injuring yourself. Um, so number one, absolutely um, having that disc there prevents the risk of that happening. But secondly, there are a couple of other things. So when you're fighting in armour, one of the openings, if you're both fighting with daggers or if one person's using half sword, whatever, if you've got a dagger in your hand, one of the openings is actually to the inside of the hand. And this is actually described in Fiore. Um, so in fact, if we look at numerous sources, both artistic and technical treatises, we see that this is a, in armoured fighting, this is an opening. Oh, I'm not wearing a glove, incidentally, I'd normally be wearing a leather glove in here. Sometimes you get a mailed, in other words, covered in mail or chain mail, but usually it's bare leather in here. Okay. Sometimes even in art, we see bare hands. So if you look at some 15th and 16th century artwork, particularly from Germany, you do see gauntlets worn like this, just with these leather straps and no leather on the inside, which seems a bit foolhardy to me, but does seem to be historical. So one opening is in here and therefore to there as well. Another in opening incidentally is into the back of the gauntlet here. And there is, I know a technique which is described actually pulling the person's gauntlet up there and jamming your dagger down into the back of it. Obviously that could be done the other way around to the inside there. So these are all openings you can get to. And if you stab someone in the hand, they can't use their hand properly, they can't fight properly. So it might seem like a minor wound, you're not gonna kill them, but it's actually a very important wound because it might, um, it might basically ruin their ability to fight you. Um, so the um, rondel dagger is actually quite good at filling that gap. So if you're presenting the point forwards to someone and you're fighting, wrestling, whatever, it actually fills that gap quite nicely, um, or at least most of it, and prevents the point coming into your um, gauntlet opening. Okay, that's the first thing. But the second thing is about force transmission. And I've spoken about this in a video previously, um, where 
basically if you're trying to stab through mail or gambeson or something like this you're ap applying a huge amount of energy um, to the target and in doing so having a disc there a platform essentially to apply that energy to um, is very very beneficial and this is clearly something which is more applicable it's not only applicable to but it's more applicable to people fighting in armor um, because of course they are more catered towards fighting other people in armor so let's come back to the um, bollock dagger for a minute so um, the bollock dagger doesn't have those features but it is very, very much more comfortable to hold in a bare hand. And it's also much, much more versatile. These bollock dagger hilts are very much more comfortable for a person with an ungloved hand um, to, to handle and manipulate. And they also give you a lot more options. Um, so obviously most of them, until we talked about the Tudor examples later, most of them don't have this kind of disc at the back end. Although some of them, as Todd showed, do flare a lot more at the back end. And that does enable you to pull them up um, out of the scabbard quickly and easily, but perhaps in a slightly more com um, comfortable way than the quite abrupt um, kind of brutal disc that we find on rondel daggers. But additionally, the actual bollocks themselves, shall we say, which I won't call a guard because they're not really a guard, they do perform the purpose of stopping your hand sliding onto the blade uh, when you're using them. But they're not such an abrupt, um, kind of almost crude way of stopping the hand. Um, and bear in mind that obviously most of the people using these, a lot of the time anyway, but it's difficult to make generalizations, but a lot of the time, they're not going to have gloved hands. And gloves do change a lot. First of all, gloves do make these sorts of hilts more comfortable. But having gloves on also makes it more likely that if you were wearing gloves, it would ride over this type of bollock um, stop, should we call rather than a guard, okay, or bolster. So um, it's more comfortable against the hand um, and it's uh, not necessary to have a big disc if you don't have gloves, for example, or gauntlets. Um, but in addition, this is also much, much more um, versatile. And so Todd talked a little bit about edge alignment. Now, I don't fully agree with that point um, in that uh, I, I do agree, or rather, that they often have cylindrical grips. And because they have cylindrical grips, yes, having the bollocks on the side uh, can aid with finding where the edge is. That is true. However, I think that if they were overly concerned about edge alignment, then they would have done the octagonal grips that we see later on the uh, Tudor examples or, or dudgeons. And or equally, they would have made a flatter grip like we see on some types of basilard, okay? Um, particularly on the so-called Holbein type daggers that we find from Switzerland. So I don't think that was necessarily a massive concern. And equally, how are you supposed to feel which direction the edge is with those bollocks anyway? Because they're kind of round. Yes, you can hold them like this, and that does kind of help. Um, so that is possible. There is, there is some way that that could help. Um, but there, there is another way that daggers are often used, and that is actually with the thumb against the flat. And if we look at, and I'm gonna be referring to this in a second later, if we look at things like the Langmesser, or the, um, the peasant knife, for example, we often see that the um, thumb is used against the flat and the nagel, uh, which we find on knife versions, small knife dagger versions of these as well, sticks on the other side. So we shouldn't always think about the edge being held like a sword in the same, or in fact, not always like a sword, but like most people would think of a sword being held in line with the forearm and the fist as it were. Very often the blade is held flat. We see this for example with later left hand daggers um, and in fact if we look at the dudgeon I've got down here this actually has an asymmetrical blade the like you would find on a mound gauche and that recess is often shown with the thumb in it so this could be used um, like that okay so very often the edges aren't held forwards and backwards front and back as they as you might think of it but very often the edges are actually held sideways and you might have the edge one way uh, for one type of action and the other way for the other type of action so um, the bollock dagger is very, very versatile in terms of which way round you hold it. Yes, you can have it edge forward or you can have it edge sideways. And either way is very comfortable. And actually, if you have the edge sideways, the thumb sits very comfortably between the bollocks, so to speak. Um, but there is yet a further um, nice versatility that you have with this style of hilt that you don't have with the rondel dagger. So the rondel dagger, 
certainly when you've got a rear disc on here kind of and forces you to hold it in quite a ham-fisted and in fact hammer-fisted way um, and that's fine for armored combat that's fine for armored fighting it's very secure it's very powerful but it's not very versatile with the uh, bollock dagger style of grip not only can you hold it with the edge in any direction okay but you can also hold it in in more of a knife fighting type or more conventional view of knife fighting type of grip and shifting the grip so my view is that basically these hilts are fighting hilts, okay? They're not, they're not utilitarian tool hilts, okay? Um, but they are fighting hilts. And obviously they have a certain style to them that has I, sort of iconic um, and probably phallic um, intentions. But they're actually very, very versatile for people who primarily have bare hands or at most some gloves rather than people who predominantly have these right i'm just going to finish off by um considering the fact as i mentioned in the late 14th century we start to see that sometimes the people that normally would have been wearing these are sometimes shown wearing these so sometimes knights and men-at-arms started wearing um, bollock daggers or bollock knives instead of rondel daggers but uh, this is quite commonly observed, I think, because a lot of people look at effigies and brasses of knights. But if you look at the medieval art, you can often see archers, spearmen, billmen, crossbowmen, gunners, people like this, people operating siege machinery, who are also wearing daggers. Now, those people often are wearing a type of basilard or a type of bollock dagger, but sometimes they're wearing these. So you can, in, fi in fact, find non-knight or non-men-at-arms characters in the medieval art who are wearing rondel daggers and i think it's wrong to characterize these as knightly daggers at least purely so they were i think in their inception the specialized armored fighting dagger yes no question for all the reasons that i've mentioned so far however because of their iconic um sort of status and the the fact that they were associated with people who were professional soldiers and let's face it probably a lot of these were captured and taken um, in war as booty these did pass into the hands and probably sometimes were especially made for cheaper versions like this sort of budget versions were made for pe people who were soldiers in many cases professional soldiers but who weren't knights or men at arms in other words they weren't wearing full harness but they were wearing some armor some cases even no armor and they were more likely equipped because they were doing things like operating crossbows longbows siege machinery guns whatever um, and they did carry these um, rondel daggers sometimes and equally the knights did carry these so there was there was um, there was interchangeability and you do find high status versions of these and you do find low status versions of these um, and one thing I wanted to mention for comparison is I think it, particularly in the 15th century we start to see weapons that were commonly regarded as lower status so things like the Langmesser here we do see them start to pass into the hands of the upper classes and become gentrified and we have posh versions of them and I think to a certain degree that's what we're seeing with the bollock knife or bollock dagger sometimes a, 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 a gentleman or a, a noble looked at these things and thought I really like those i really like these messers and bon uh, bollock knives bollock daggers i want to posh one of those and we see this with the emperor maximilian we see it even with henry VIII. they did have posh versions of messers they did have posh versions of um, bollock daggers so sometimes we see um, the uh, the material culture the social mobility of material culture moving upwards so um, you know things going from bollock daggers um, get made into posh versions and messes get made into po posh versions and used by the nobility and sometimes we see it the other way around where the rondel daggers we see cheaper versions of them made for the um, soldiers who have less money to spend anyway i hope that's been somewhat interesting and uh, useful please go and have uh, todd's uh, give todd's video a like uh, uh, and a view of course but he's had tons of views so i'm sure you've probably seen that already um, but i hope this has been a useful addition and appendix to that video and i'll see you again soon on this channel on scholar gladiatoria and maybe we'll talk more about daggers or messers or something else of interest to you suggestions for other videos below of course give us a like and a subscribe if you haven't done already and i'll see you soon cheers folks thanks for watching we've got extra videos on patreon please give our facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already Cheers, folks.